believe it or not, um, I do not enjoy being up here because um, for the hardcore technical presentations um, where you show code, being in the big room is always a problem. And I'm going to show code, so there's going to be a problem. But um, to make up for that, I've also had some, I put some fluff in for the beginning of the presentation. Hi, I'm Stefan. I'm a consultant. I coach teams. Um, I'm writing stuff as in books, ebooks, and so on. I give lectures at University of Rosenheim every once in a while on web programming. And I'm a proven scalability expert, which means I'm the father of twins. Um, I work for that company, the PHP consulting company, which I co-founded with Sebastian Bergman and Arne Blankatz. We help teams build better software. We help companies deal with their PHP technology-related problems and sometimes also with people technology-related people problems kind of things. Um, short disclaimer before I start, I'm going to show some code. It's not production-ready. It's uh, copy, pasted, and edited to fit on the screen. Some details are left out. It's code that is meant to be for me to, to allow me to explain things to you. It's not production ready. So don't copy and paste that and blame me that it doesn't work. Um, other than that, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me. I think it's time you should meet Bob. This is Bob. Bob, strapping young lad. Um, this is Bob's house. He likes to take a swim in the morning. He likes to barbecue. Actually, this is only one of Bob's houses. This is Denver. He also has a house in Los Angeles, uh, um, an apartment in New York, and I think he has um, another house in southern France. Um, this is how he gets from Los Angeles to New York, and this is how he moves around when he's in southern France. Of course, he has to get to southern France some way. So this is how he usually does that. Of course, he has a hobby. This is his favorite hobby. And Bob was born and raised on a farm in Kansas. He used to climb trees. He built tree houses. And he always said, I'm going to be big and famous when I'm grown up. And after finishing high school, Bob went off to work in Wall Street. He was very lucky to land a great job as an investment banker with a company um, called Lehman Brothers. So he was doing really well around 2006. And then times got a little less great. Um, Bob actually made it through the bad times Pretty well, his wife did not, um, and Bob had some personal issues for a while, but he was saved and actually considered turning a priest, but then he fell in love. He met this beautiful woman, um, she was 98 living in that castle, and shortly after that, they got married in an undisclosed location. Um, tragically, on their, a few weeks after that, um, when they were hiking in the Himalaya, the old lady mysteriously died, and this is, this is where Bob, well. Okay, and Bob really got bored with everything basically after a while, so he chose to live as Barbara. So this is Barbara, she's married to Alice. Okay? So these are crazy times we live in, everything changes. Um, well, where did Bob live in 2008? Kind of hard to figure out, right? Actually, as of today, the proper question to ask, where did Barbara live in 2008? And then we would have to be clever enough to figure out that Barbara in 2008 actually was Bob. And we could try to figure out where Bob lived. 
That's kind of weird, right? And what is Bob's gender? Wait, what is Barbara's gender? Or is it depending on when we ask the question? It's kind of weird. And it's pretty confusing. Always reminds me of Back to the Future, where Marty McFly, after the time machine has disappeared for the first time, says, where the hell are they? And then Doc Brown says, the appropriate question is, when the hell are they? Yeah. Everything changes. This is really confusing. So actually, I've, I remember having that conversation with developers about a personal record, right? So it's just data, and we just record, you know, a name and gender and address, and that's it. Okay, so, but then at some point, people tend to move. So their address changes. So actually, the address data is temporal. Okay, I can live with that. Well, turns out that the name of people is also temporal. I have multiple friends and relatives who, even as males, got married and took the name of their wife. I mean, one of my friend's names was Schmidt. If you're not familiar, it's one of the most common names in Germany, and his wife had a more unique name, so he figured it would be a good opportunity to make his name more unique. So he changed his name. Um, and women have traditionally been changing their names when they got married. Now they can do that or they can't do it. And I really haven't figured out how it's with the kids when they initially have a name and then the parents get married. Does the name of the children also change? I, I don't even know that. So the name is temporal. Well, as of today, it seems that the gender is temporal as well. And pretty much everything else is temporal. Have you read the news about that guy who was like a, a child that was um, lost their parents and everything in the war? And he always figured that he was so old and that that was his birthday. And like 50 years later, they found his original birth certificate. And they realized, oh, no, <laughs> that's not your birthday. Your birthday is different. Well, it seems like this kind of data is also temporal. At least it needs to be able to change, and that's probably something you have not accounted for. Now, um, I'll finish that, that example. Um, you know that the, the same-sex marriage has legally been become possible in Germany last year, and I don't know if you followed that. There is a fun thing happening with that, um, and I'm quoting from Deutsche Welle. When the law takes an effect on October 1st, registry systems will not allow bureaucrats to enter two people of the same gender into one marriage. Because the fundamental business rule has always been that a man and a woman get married. And now these systems suddenly have a problem because that fundamental business rule is, well, has changed. It seems that the administrative, administrative institutions that register marriages were unable to keep up. It continues. It will take more than a year to update the software. And it gets worse because for the time being, people have to enter wrong information to even make it possible for same-sex couples to get married. That's pretty bad. I'm not, um, I'm not really um, familiar with any details, but as far as I could research it, the problem seems to be not the original software, but the, the official registry that is based on an XML format, and that XML format has a, re a release cycle of 12 months, and it was not ready as of last year, so they, that's why they have to wait for one year because they cannot get the information. They basically, they cannot create the XML because they were clever enough to not put person in there, but man and woman kind of thing, and that doesn't work anymore. But maybe Jason and, well, no, I'm not going there. <laughs> so, um, we're going to be talking about event sourcing and um, CQRS, and this really is an introductory talk, I'm going to show code, I'm going to explain the basic concepts, so if you're familiar with the concepts, it's probably going to be a little boring for you, but then again, there will be code. So, it turns out that everything changes. 
all data is temporal. And it seems that a lot of problems with existing systems is that initially you assume that for the purposes of the system you are building, you can safely assume that certain things are fixed and they are not going to change, but at some, time, at some point they change. Maybe there is a le new legal requirement and things change. And so it seems like everything is in movement, everything is, is in flow, and it seems to be really hard to deal with that. And there is a reason for that. Traditionally, as computer scientists, we have always built systems that were strongly focused on state. What is the state of something now? What does, does that thing look like now? That's usually what most systems deal with. Rarely that systems kind of are able to go back in history and say, what was the state of that as of like half a year ago? Version control actually is pretty, pretty clever at that. And any system really dealing with customer relations, addresses and stuff, they of course also have figured out that people move around. We use stuff like LinkedIn or Xing. And it's the same thing, people move, people change their companies, but they still have their account that we are linked with so we can find them. That's kind of cool. But essentially, it's a kind of temporal data modeling, right? Um, the, the, the thing or LinkedIn ID is the identifier, and under that identifier, you can look the person up and figure out where they are working now or where they are living now. The thing is, if you realize that a piece of data should have been temporal, that in the original design of your software was, non, was modeled as non-temporal, all your queries are going to break. Because temporal data is not as easy as joining a foreign key, if you think about the SQL database at least. Um, and it is perfectly possible to model temporal databases. I can assure you that it's not fun and it's not fun to query them. Everything is possible, but it's kind of, we're not enjoying ourselves. So maybe we should challenge the assumption of focusing so much on state and building state-based systems. Look at Bob's life. Well, the state of Bob's life constantly changed the amount of money he had in his bank account state has changed. His address changed, his gender changed, his marriage changed. He was married, he was unmarried, he was married again. So there was a lot of changes to Bob's state, if you will. Um, why don't we look at those state changes, at those things that happen, at those events, rather than the state itself. Because the world is based on events. Things happen. And the interesting observation is, while where data seems to be temporal, events are immutable. If I drop a glass, the glass is going to break. I cannot undo that. I can repair the glass. I can buy a new glass. I can try to sweep it under the rug, but I cannot undo the fact. So an event that has happened is inevitable, and we can't change it, right? If I say something stupid today, I might regret it tomorrow, but I have said it. I can't undo that. Some people suffer badly from having done things they shouldn't have done. You can't undo them. So it turns out that events the world is a series of events happening, and each event is something that is inevitable and immutable. If it has happened, we can record it, and it's not going to change. So, why not model a system by looking at the events that have led to a certain state, rather than looking at a certain state and having to deal with temporal data. One of the cool things about immutable data, events are immutable data because they cannot be changed. There can be corrective events following an event, right? If I deduct 10,000 euros from my bank account today, that's probably not going to work. 
even if the bank initially gives me the money, they'll come back tomorrow and say, I'm sorry, we're going to undo that. Or if worse, somebody puts, puts uh, money into a wrong account, it's going to end up there, but they're going to deduct it again. So it has been there, and there was a corrective event. It's like a corrective booking in bookkeeping. You don't cross out bookings. You don't change bookings. So the immutability concept has been around for a long time, actually goes back to medieval times, when in Italy, bookkeeping was, um, was being developed. And actually, it was a friend of Leonardo da Vinci who did that. And they came up with the idea, or he came up with the idea of make a journal, and you never change a journal. If you have made a booking, it's, uh, it's recorded, it's a fact. You can make a corrective booking, but you're never going to go back and change a booking that you made. So, the cool thing about immutable data is <laughs> it's easy to cache. Because by definition, it never changes, right? So, if I put immutable data into a cache, I can leave it there forever. And I, have, I don't have to worry about invalidating that cache because that data never changes. That's kind of cool. So it seems that maybe we will be able to build really scalable systems using these kinds of ideas. Now, don't be tempted to think that this is a new idea. Event sourcing as a term has been around, I think, um, since 2011, 2010, 2011, when Greg Young gave presentations at QCon, I believe, where he said, well, I have built these systems based on um, events and a stream of events, and instead of state, focusing on state, he was actually building trade systems, I believe, and he was giving a presentation and people like Martin Fowler listened into that and said, hey, you need to find a term for that because it's a cool concept and you need to have a name for it so people can start adopting that. That's at some point where event sourcing um, as a term was born. Um, in fact, we have always built systems like that because most systems we have ever built deal with money Whenever we deal with money, we go by the rules of bookkeeping, and bookkeeping is, well, how do you determine the amount of money that you have in your bank account? You take the initial amount, which usually is zero when you open up the account, and then there is money coming in and money going out. And you add it up, so you get what's in your account. This is event sourcing. Each booking record is an event, and if you source the state of your bank account from this sequence of events, you get what you have in your account currently. Very interesting. Has a few interesting properties because by definition, you can look at the stream of events from the beginning of times until a certain point. So if you want to know how did that thing look yesterday, you can just look at the sequence of events until yesterday and you will exactly be able to reproduce the state a system or an object was in yesterday. State-based systems usually can't do that. That's why we have such a hard time reproducing bugs. Somebody reports a bug against production. What's the problem? There was a state that caused a bug and this state has changed because data has changed. And an hour later, you will not be able to reproduce the bug. You might be able by coincidence, but generally, nobody guarantees you that you can reproduce that bug. And that's why we go bug hunting so much against live systems or problems in live systems. Oh, I can't even reproduce that on QA or on testing or on my dev box. With an event source system, you can. Because the state of the system is derived from the stream of events. Okay, now. Let's get down to the nitty gritty. I brought you some sample code because that's essentially, actually it's pretty, well, actually it's pretty simple, just a few lines of code. If you look at it, it it's probably, yeah, it took me a while to get there and it's probably gonna take everybody a while to understand that because it's just a different way of thinking. But honestly, we've always done that. 
How does your version, what's, what's your favorite version console? It's probably something like Git, right? How does Git work? You check in a file, and then you apply a change to the file. What internally, Git creates a diff, and it records the diff. It does not record the new state of the file. It just records a sequence of diffs. And if you ask Git for, what does the file look as of now? It's going to take the initial state and apply the patches. Yes, it's called event sourcing. Now, if you want to see the state as of yesterday, hopefully you have a tag or you have some commit against, have some commit ID that you can use and say, okay, so replay all the events until that commit. And you're going to exactly see how your file looked yesterday. How about relational databases? Relational databases are event source systems. Do you believe me? I'll prove it to you. So you have tables, and the table are a materialization of the current state of the database. So that can't possibly be event sourced, you're saying. No. Well, what happens if your database crashes? There's a binary log. What's the binary log? The binary log is a log of all the transactions of all the queries that you have sent against your database, executed against your database. So that's a log of events. This query has happened. This insert has happened. This update has happened. Now, if your tables become inconsistent and your database crashes, what it's going to do is going to rebuild the tables from the binary log. It's event sourcing. If you replicate your database to another remote database, it's technically the same thing that's happening. It's event sourcing and the remote is catching up. So actually, a lot of systems have always conceptually been event sourced. For some reason, we got so focused on state-based systems that event sourcing kind of, well, fell off the table maybe. Greg Young coined the term, it has been um, very um, commonly used in recent years. Um, I think it's a very interesting concept. So. Let's look at some code. First of all, we need events. An event is really simple, it's just a DTO. So the example I'm showing here is just a counter. right? You can initialize a counter with a value and you can increment the counter. It's a very simple, basic example so that the code will actually fit on the slide. So I think you can't see the pointer, so I'm going to have a hard time pointing that out. But basically, this is just a DTO, a data object. It's just, well, I have a counter that has an ID. I'm using a UUID for that, and it has an initial value, which is an integer. OK, and I'm using that fancy named constructor, which is just uh, has a reason f uh, that you don't see. That's because I'm, I've, I've left out some code. But essentially, this is just, you can ask it for the counter ID, you can ask it for the initial value, and then this is something a little special, that's a string identifier of that event, because I don't want to work with the class names, so I'm using that string, that's basically just so that code can react to events and doesn't have to do that based on class names. Right, um, that, that's it. So if we record, the fact that we have initialized a counter, then we can create this event. And let's just assume we're going to magically store that somewhere. It's called an event store. Now, we have a second event, counter incremented. Counter incremented, well, obviously, we have to memorize which counter we have incremented and also which value we have incremented the counter to. And then again, it's just that simple DTO. Now, let's first of all figure out how we could create a counter object 
of these events. Then in a second pass, let's worry about where did these events come from originally. Actually, let's, let's do it the other way around. So, this is my counter. Um, I'm going to show you the base class I'm using in a minute. When I initialize the counter, I pass an initial value. Okay? And this basically just calls the constructor. And here's some fanciness because I have two ways to create this object. One is if I initialize the counter, that's my business constructor. I now need a new counter. This is the initial value. And the other thing is going to be our technical constructor. That's what the one that we're going to be using when we wake up the object from persistence, right? So I have two different ways of creating a business object. The one is that one time where I actually do a business-wise creation, like an invoice. You create it once, you assign an invoice number, then you may take the object and put it to sleep in your persistence infrastructure, and at some later point you'll wake it up again. So you recreate the object. And that recreation um, happens here. Let's not deal with that. So for now, if we are not creating from existing events, then we will record our counter initialized event. We will generate a UUID and pass the initial value. So this is where we create, where we generate the events. If the counter has decided that it can be created, there might be guard clauses preventing them, that, then we will create an event and we will record an event. We we'll get into the record in a minute. Okay, if we increment a counter, well, we'll increment the counter and we'll record the fact that the counter has been incremented. Now, this is a very simple example. There are no guard clauses. There is no possibility for the counter to say, uh -uh, I'm sorry, you cannot increment me because it's Monday, right? In a real life object, there would be guard clauses like, what, it, it's Monday, you can't increment me, or your name is Müller, you cannot increment me, or well, whatever, right? And in case we are not up to being incremented as a counter, we just throw an exception. No, you can't do that. Sorry, Dave, I can't do that. Okay, we can ask the counter for the value, and this is, this, this is the ugliest method. Now, um, let's look at, yeah, um, but, um, okay. Um, I should have rearranged, let's, yeah, okay, let's look at that. Um, now let's do pass two, and then we get down into the nitty gritty base class. Pass two would be if we want to recre uh, recreate our counter from events, we would pass in a collection of events, which is technically just an array that's typed, and we pass that to the constructor of the parent class. Some magic happens there, and from a business perspective, these are the two interesting methods, right? If there was a counter initialized event, to apply that, we'll take the ID that we have recorded in the event. This is going to be our object ID. And we take the initial value from the event and memorize that as our current initial value. So essentially, what the constructor does is it doesn't change the object state, it records an event. And when that event is applied, the state change is being derived from data out of that event. The same with apply counter increment, we'll just take the value from the event and set the value. Now, apply methods are actually used both when we initially do something, and when we reconstitute our object. And this is the ugliness I was talking about. We need that ugliness because we don't have overloading in PHP, right? In a decent language, well, no. In another language, we could, we could overload that method and say, for counter incremented dispatch to this one, for counter initialized is dispatch to that one. In PHP, I can't do that. That's why I have the name in here. And I'll have to manually code that dispatch. And this is why I have the strings, right? So 
I have a generic apply method, apply an event to this object. And if it's an initialized event, then run the apply counter initialized method. And if it's a counter incremented event, then apply the counter incremented event. That's basically just boilerplate code. Now that seems, it, it seem, doesn't seem complicated. And the infrastructure below that is not more complicated than that. So, we need to be able to create an object from events. That's the parent constructor thing, right? And we will record events that are called state changes here. So whenever the state of our object changes, an event is recorded. That's what happens right here. And here, okay? So, um, this is our constructor. In the case that there are events, basically forget about the guard clause. This is the interesting part, and the rest is garbage. Reconstitute from events. Rebuild the state of this object from events. Now, in case you thought that would be complicated, um, it's not. <laughs> That's all it does. Okay, go through all the events and apply them one by one. That's all. Recording of events means apply them and memorize them as state changes. And then there is this outrageously complex method which returns all the state changes that, had have, that have happened. So that's the changes that have happened to the object since it was initially created or loaded from persistence. The set ID and that crap we can basically forget, that's not important. It's just paranoia to make sure that the ID of an object does not change. Okay. Those events that are recorded as state changes, they get stored in an event store. An event store is basically just a database table that stores all the events, which can be just serialized data or whatever format you like. Um, people usually use something like JSON. And now we can basically fake a sequence of events. We create a counter ID and initialize the counter with one and increment it twice. So if we reconstitute a counter from that, we actually get a counter having the value of three with a given ID. Now here's the fun part. Who is using Doctrine ORM or something similar? How many lines of code does Doctrine have? How many lines of code did you see in that example? That's a full-fledged persistence mechanism. It's a counter domain object that can be persisted in an event store. It's kind of neat. So plus the event store, we would actually be looking at around 300 lines of code. And this is not an exaggeration. I've built it and I've seen it work. You can use other solutions. People, some people like to use Kafka or some, some other um, um, queuing mechanism as an event store, you can use plain MySQL and just build a database table to throw the events in there um, for reasons I will be explaining in a couple of minutes. But that's actually all there is to it. It's a seemingly new concept that has actually been very old. Actually, it's a pretty natural concept, right? Events happen, our software makes decisions and records events, and we can rebuild the state of the software from events. Usually people now say, wow, that's probably going to be slow. Not really. Actually, event source systems are pretty fast. And funny enough, for a regular PHP application, right, you have a web request that you process, and say you have a million counters in your system, we'll probably only work with one counter at a time. So even if we have a million counter and Bunch, a bunch, a couple of million events in our event store. If we want to source one counter, we'll actually need three events. So it's just a parameterized query to our event store in database speak, not to load five million events and throw them all away, but select those that are relevant, 
which coincidentally are exactly those events that have originally been emitted by an encounter given that UUID. So that's your mechanism to find these events. And this is why our event carries the counter ID. So basically, counter ID or, or aggregate ID, whatever you want to call it, becomes um, a property of your database table. And you will be able to selectively load events from your event store just for one object. And you can reconstitute that one object. It's actually um, maybe, maybe even quicker than the regular way, but I think in that example, it's probably going to be on par. OK. Second concept, somehow closely related. You'll see why in a minute, but also something completely independent. So what is the difference between a getter and a setter? One is pure, the other has side effects. So the getter retrieves state and does not change the state. The setter, also called a mutator, changes state. This has been written in 1983 by Bertrand Meyer in his book Object-Oriented Software Construction. It's called the command query separation rule. We all have learned to stick to that. If you ask your object a question, and this question changes the state of your object, that's weird. So what is the difference between a HTTP GET request and an HTTP POST request? OK, get is reading, post is writing, aka changing state. Get needs to be idempotent, so you can ask the same questions as often as you like. It's not going to change the answer. And if your server receives a get request, it's not significant, significantly going to change its state. It's always technically going to change its state because it's going to log the request, which is a kind of state change. But your application state, usually does not change when you process a GET request. So the fundamental idea of this, ID, of this concept called CQRS, which is a generalization of command query separation, is let's build separate models. Traditionally, we have built one model, one piece of software for reading and writing. We have used one persistence mechanism for both. Let's assume you have a MySQL database. And I'm asking you to optimize your database because performance sucks. What are you going to do? Set indexes, probably. Run some explains, look at the logs, find slow queries, all that kind of stuff. What are you optimizing for? You're optimizing for reading. Because most traffic your application gets is read traffic. So I've heard anything between 10 to 1 to 10,000 to 1 as in read versus write requests. We spend most of our time, or application spends most of its time processing read requests. And you have a software, you have, a, you have your, all your tables, you're using an ORM, maybe or not, you're building objects from that, and then you're passing your objects to your view, or you're creating arrays out of your object and pass those to your view, and your view creates nice HTML and delivers that. And all of that, why are you doing that? Well, you're doing that because your data source is that way. Your data source caters to use cases. You're reading from it and you're writing to it. And it turns out that normalized relational databases are optimized for writing. Well, first of all, they eliminate redundancy. So they are optimized for saving space, as in storage space, because memory was expensive when databases came up. Nowadays, storage is not expensive. Google stores the whole web and even version, versioned, and the NSA st stores the whole communication on the web, and that's probably whatever, so storage seems to be cheap now, these days. Still, a database is optimized for writing. You can change the zip code of Berlin, changing just one record 
in a normalized database. That's great. Saves you a shitload of work versus changing the zip code in, say, a million addresses. Hmm, is that a common use case? I'd say no. Even if it happens, well, it can be slow. It's not a common use case. A common use case is retrieving data. And to retrieve data, we have to join tables. We have normalized the database to save space and optimize thus for writing because we only need to change the information once and that update automatically affects a bunch of records that link to that. But we seldomly write. If we think in events rather than state, well, events are immutable, the writing thing becomes a whole different story because now we are suddenly talking about an append-only store. It's a log file. An event store is a log file. We only append. We never change existing data. So reading is easy to scale. But how about separate models? Now, if we have one piece of data representation and one piece of software to both run commands, do the state changes, make decisions, and deliver content, ask, answer questions. Well, how can we optimize, what can we, how, how should we optimize that software? It's always a, a foul compromise. Same with databases. Now, just let's assume for a second we would be free of all limitations that there existed until this point, and we'll create two separate models for that. So we can have one model that's optimized for writing. We could use that event sourcing stuff that I've talked about earlier. So we have an event log. And our software can, based on this event log, build business objects that make decisions. So we got the command part covered. And actually, this is how a command looks like. Surprise, it's a DTO. It's just a data object. Please initialize that counter to this value. It looks very similar to the event, but the intent is very different. A command is asking the system to do something. Whether the system does that or not depends on the state of the system. On Monday, you cannot create counters, so there is an exception. If a counter gets created, internally, the event that we've seen before gets created and stored. Now we have created a fact. So a command is something that you ask the system to do something. It may or may not do that. An event is something inevitable. It has happened. We can't undo that. OK. Um, so what about the queries then? Well, we have that side down. The queries, if you just deliver content whole day, how would ideally, how would your persistence mechanism, or how would your setup look like? I'm going to tell you what it would look like. You would put HTML files into the file system and put a, a web server in front so that you can serve static files. That's the fastest thing that's possible. Why would you put the stuff in a different format so that you have to read it and convert it and then deliver the HTML? when you can directly deliver the HTML, or to put that in other words, you can pre-generate your HTML. There is no reason whatsoever to build your pages on request. Yes, I know personalization is an issue. Um, it doesn't hurt the general concept, though. You can build most of the page statically. And you can build the building blocks, even if they are personalized, you can build them up front. So your delivery is just basically delivering static data, and literally there is only basically going to be the decision, are you allowed to see that? And if you are allowed to see more than your coworker, then probably you're going to see one representation of the data and your coworker is going to see a different representation of the data. This, in this CQRS world, is called projections. It's projections of state, of data. It's state. It's essentially another type of event sourcing. If we have a stream of events, 
we can go through the stream of events and create any visual representation that we like, which can be an HTML page or a building block for an HTML page or a PDF or whatever. And we can put that somewhere. And when people ask for it, we can deliver it in a very, very lightweight fashion. That's CQRS to its full extent. It's based on the idea of creating separate models for the main use cases that your application has. And if you want to go back to solid principles, what's the S in solid? Single responsibility. Now, if, and it, if there should only be one reason for a piece of software to change. Now, if your piece of software is an object, and this object does commands and queries, you have two reasons to change the object. So you're violating the S in solid. That's why you have a maintenance problem in your software. If you build two separate models, you have less of maintenance issues because you can evolve those models independently. And both only depend on the events, and they don't even know each other. There is no runtime dependency. Now you're saying, well, that sounds weird. How do you do that? Well, it's actually pretty simple, and here's a code example. That's a so-called dispatcher for, for a projector. If an event has happened, we're going to look at what event is that, and then we are going to create our projection, which in that case is a very simple object that just builds state. It has a counter and it even counts the amount of times it has been incremented. And I can use this to create HTML or any other representation from that in a very lightweight fashion. So that's how the query side works. Now, unfortunately, we have those 45 minutes time slots, which is really sucky because I'm already over time. Luckily, that's the content I've planned for. Uh, allow me just that one um, shameless plug. A while ago, um, and I've been talking about event sourcing and CQRS for a while at conferences, people started coming up to me like, do you have source code I can look at? Well, this is the answer. There is the source code you have been asking for, and actually, um, um, I'm in the process of writing an ebook on the whole thing, which is going to be available at this URL. Um, you can go there now and register with a mailing list, which probably is not GDPR compliant. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a German mailing list. Um, and I will only email you about the book if you're interested in that. Um, it's probably going to take me a couple of days to write the book. But the more people are signed up for the mailing list and keep bugging me with wishes, requests, and feedback is probably going to encourage me to, um, to work through that more. And basically, the book is going to be based on code examples that you've just seen and some more cool stuff, of course. Um, this is where the slides are going to be available, talks.thephp.cc. It was my pleasure to be your host. If you have any questions, I'll be around for the day. And tomorrow, I'll give another uh, <clears throat> I'll be giving another presentation on design patterns tomorrow morning, if you're not yet fed up with me. Um, otherwise, thanks for listening. <laughs>